Okay, and then Bob, can we share the GIS for the Eureka property? Not that one. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'm ready when you are. Yep, go ahead and let's open it up and read it. Okay, so public hearing is opened at 917. The first request that we have before us today is for Nick Walton Properties LLC requesting a conditional use permit to operate a gravel pit under section 10.4.13 parentheses C of the Polk County Comprehensive Land Use Ordinance. The property affected is the northeast quarter of the southeast quarter of section 2, town 35 north, range 18 west, town of Eureka. Parcel number is 020-00038. Zero 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 zero. Um, this property is a full forty acres, and that, or it's a full forty, um, and that it has town road access. Um, there is line just to the south of the property. That on the adjoining forty, um, it's down in the corner. The property um, here, and that was just rezoned to mining and confirmed by the county board. I had just seen this in front of you a couple months ago. Um, you can see the map here that I've got up is the LIDAR data for the county. Um, and you can see there's a lot of that topography up there. Uh, there's a lot of hills. Um, the county has sent out the proper notices in that for the conditional use permit. Um, in order to take and have a mine larger than one acre in size out there, they are required to obtain the conditional use through the committee here. Um, when you guys are looking at a conditional use and that we got those same uh, criteria in the ordinance as far as maintaining safety and health and uh, controlling of water pollution and um, the wells and that kind of stuff. So that's the kind of stuff that you'd wanna look at. The town of Eureka approved the rezone um, and that, but I believe Don Anderson from the town is here to provide comment today. <laughs> And we did receive one letter um, of kind of support and opposition. And it's from Amber Thompson. And she goes, it's, it's an email and I'll read it. And there's a whole bunch of conditions in that that they are proposing. And it says, hi, Jason, below are our requests that we'd like to see put on the conditional use permit for Nick Walton's Eureka pit. Uh, number one is a 250 foot offset on the east side of the property to keep the noise down because Amber works from home. I should just point out and that uh, Thompson's uh, live, I think it's right here. No crusher. Mr. Walton told the township board members that he was going to process material at his other pit on 240th Avenue. No scale. Mr. Walton told the township board members that he would not put a scale on the property. Number four, Nick Walton's trucks are only allowed to haul out of the pit. Mr. Walton told the township board members that he would be the only one hauling out of the pit and that he was going to keep the pit private. Number five is hours of operation to be 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Monday through Friday only. Number six is a 50 foot max depth from highest point on the property to the pit floor. We would like to see this because Amber has spent over 10,000 on her health and this depth, this depth would help protect the aquifer as we have good water at this time, a benchmark to be set. Number seven, no hauling of black dirt off the mining site uh, so that they are able to reclaim the pit in the future. Number eight, no concrete, blacktop, stumps, trees or brush or other debris to be hauled into the mine site and dumped. Number nine is no wash plant or dry screen plant. Mr. Walton told the town board members that he would process the material at the other location on 240th Avenue. And number 10 is no well to be drilled to protect our well. As we stated previously, 
our water is good and Amber has spent over 10,000 on her health. Number 11 is no asphalt or concrete plant to be put in at the mine site. Number 12 is no storing of unused equipment not used for the mining at the site. And number 13 is no blasting at the mine site because of noise and vibrations. And number 14 is the final one and that and that's dust control to keep the silica dust down for health reasons. And then it goes on, if crushing is permitted at the site, we would only want crushing to happen for only three consecutive weeks each year. But as stated before, Mr. Walton said he was going to process the material at his pit on 240th Avenue. So I don't see the need to crush or screen on site at this parcel. Sincerely, Amber and Tucker Cramley. Um, so that is the only um, letter that we received. Um, there is no uh, wetlands um, or floodplains on the property. There's no buildings either. Yeah, Doug. 14 again, I didn't put it. Yeah, 14. Um, dust control to keep the silica dust down for health reasons. So, yep. So no wetlands, no floodplains, no navigable waters. Um, it is adjacent to a, an existing mining site. Um, it's got the town road on that for access. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over for any other public comment that we might have. Is there anyone for or against can come up? State your name. Uh, Tucker Cramlett, I was, we sent in uh, the all. Um, there was one thing that I didn't leave off was, is if we could possibly move the driveway for the property as far north as we possibly can. Because uh, the high point on the road is right across from our driveway. So I guess I'd like, if it's safe to put that a conditional use on of moving the driveway as far north as we can so it's not directly right across from our house. And that's that's all I had. Thank you. Else. Don Anderson, I'm the town chairman for the town of Eureka. Um, we do have a driveway ordinance, but we would like to add to it that the first 200 feet of the driveway from the town road into the pit must have a two inches or inch and a half layer of clean crushed rock uh, to help clean the tires off the trucks as they leave the pit. And then of course, dust control in the pit area must be controlled. And uh, any excess sand and rock must be swept off the blacktop daily or, or however, whenever necessary. I would also like to comment at this time, um, there was previous discussion that the town board of Eureka didn't approve this as a gravel pit. We did approve this as a gravel pit or crushing that he would be allowed to, to crush there. And I think also um, the possibility of there being a scale there was approved by the township. Um, as far as a wash plant, I don't, I don't recall, but uh, just to note that we did did approve this as he could crush gravel there. I have copies of this if you'd like them. Thank you. So Nick, do you have any comments? Do you want to make? Want to come up, please? Nick Walton. Uh, I do have some comments and regarding uh, Amber and Tucker, what they would like is. I do want to note that uh, we do follow MSHA ordinances as far as dust and noise, and MSHA does cover it pretty, pretty close with us. They don't let us get by with much. Also, uh, you know, what else did I see here? Uh, the 250, 250 foot setback from the East property, I feel this is very unreasonable. Uh, what my plan was is to build a very high black dirt berm along that east side along the road. That's a that's actually a better noise suppressant. And they also won't probably won't even see what's going on in the pit. So a berm is, is much better than a 250 foot setback. 
250 foot of the land not being able to use it is, is very unreasonable in my, in my ideas. And then uh, I never did say that the, the pit would not be open to other trucks. I did at the, at the zoning meeting, we talked about, I'm not gonna have a man there manning the pit on a daily basis for the public to come in. But there will be other trucks coming in there like township, maybe another contractor from time to time or Oak County, they do uh, buy some gravel from me. So that's what I had stated at the time of the, uh, the ordinance change, and I still I still feel the same way. Other than that, I don't know. Uh, Fifty foot max. If you'll note on the on the uh, zoning map, if you look on the the footage differences, the the bottom of the other pit just to the south in the next section is seventy four feet deeper than the highest point in my land. So I don't I don't know if I'll be going below fifty feet, but I want to make sure that you know there's no reason why I can't go to the same depth as the other as the other pit. I don't I don't feel. Uh, as far as concrete and blacktop coming to there to get buried, absolutely not. I bring that to my other pit. That's where I do process for recycles. I I won't have any equipment at this pit to recycle with. So all that goes to my other pit on 240th. And as far as any Anybody ever complaining or anything? I know at my luck pit, there's five neighbors right close to that. And I have talked to them many times and you know, most of them don't even know we're ever crushing. So there's really not a dust or a noise issue. I do keep the lot uh, watered quite often to keep the dust down just for our, my own guys and our, for our own equipment. So, virtually, you guys got any questions? Well, I guess maybe it's tied back to the township wanting the 200 feet of crushed rock. So realistically, his driveway can go in and he can mine around. Exactly. I know Don had, from the Eureka Town there had mentioned that he wanted to move the driveway down farther, and I totally agree with that. I don't really want it at the top of that hill. I think it is a danger too. So I think farther to the north, and we talked about that, put a culvert in there, put a driveway in, and then the driveway would come up along the east side of the property. Where is that 50 feet and, and possibly going to 75? Was that pit to the south of there? Was that a town pit? One time? Yes. Running out of the material? I, I believe they're going to close it this summer. That, that was some facts I had. I just want to see if I had them right. Correct. Yep. Yeah. 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 Your depth is going to be related to what the way the water operates. Right. Believe so. So land and water, you know, they they're the ones that that uh, are in charge of the reclamation of it. So as we go, we like to reclaim as much as possible because it's it's quite expensive to keep it open. Large. Yeah, the, the, the idea is we're talking about five acres up to ten in the cost. Exactly. So the idea is to keep the pit as small as you possibly can to still operate financially. Thank you. Thank you. Helps. Jason, that was the, uh, the exhibit was that one. Correct. The five five zero four is uh one. This was the comment and that, that we received that Nick went down and addressed each one of these conditions. Um, there. I'll go back to the other.
Well, I took and I pulled um, that one of the conditional uses that you guys have done lately in that for the Julie pit um, and that down in the town of Alden. And the first eight here that were what was assigned on that Julie pit. Um, I think we've got some that we can add and subtract to this and that from hearing and that from our town and from Nick. Um, I don't know if you guys are ready for a recommendation yet. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So staff and that would recommend, um, you know, from hearing with the applicant and the town um, and that approving of the pit, uh, we would suggest the approval be conditioned on the washing of any material on this site. No mining into the water table. Um, business hours for that. Um, I think it's good to have some hours set. Um, and that these are uh, longer than that than what we received on public comment. Um, so that's up to the committee to decide. So crushing for twice a year. Buffer on the south and east property uh, line. The ordinance requires 100 feet. Put in parentheses there and that 150 feet if you wanted to. And that our public comment bill said that there would be a berm um, built from the applicant. So maybe that could be replaced. And that would just uh, berm is going to be constructed on the east side along the road. That would be number five. Have it as a gated access. That um, possibly limiting the amount of size that's open in that at the pit. Um, I threw out there an arbitrary number of five acres because that's what was on the Geely pit. Um, and that, but that's something that, that you guys could look at. Uh, no commercial sales are open to the public. Uh, we should probably take a strike commercial sales off from there because of hearing the applicant's testimony and just not open to the public on like a daily day uh, thing, but yet still allow them to sell to other contractors in the town. Uh, one of the public comments in that that we had received is no blasting on site. I don't believe in that, that there's a lot of trap rock there. I believe they're looking for sand and gravel. Um, so that shouldn't be an issue. And then uh, no asphalt or concrete plant on the mine site. Um, that those types of uses are actually required to have an industrial zoning classification underneath our ordinance. So we don't see an issue with that. And then to add to that, um, we had the town and that with maintaining that there's no, you know, sand and rocks and that out on the road. And also that 200 foot, I'll call it tracking driveway. Um, and that with the clean uh, rock material to clean the tires of the trucks as they leave. Driveway to the north. Uh, yep. And then you could take in and that for like the noise and the dust, if you wanted, you could just say that the operator must be in compliance with all MSHA rules and regulations. And that they are to work with the town on getting the proper driveway. Or to satisfy the town's driveway ordinance. Some of the five acres are you going to open up more than five or don't you know yet? Sure. Uh, okay, so that would be all right. What would you say? Well, the hours, what were they on this one? And the public comment. The hours in that are six to eight p.m. Monday through Friday, eight to one, and that on Saturday, no hauling on Sunday. You said they were going to be there Saturdays. You're not going to be on site on Saturday. We work some Saturdays. Okay. I think that's. I think that's fine. Those hours are fine. That is kind of the same hours that are on a lot of the uh, milestone material pits around here, and then they all kind of have the similar type of stuff. So, buffer on south and east of property 100 feet, 150 feet. 
I think you can just get rid of that. I was just trying to, I was just trying to throw an option out there, you know, and that. So a hundred foot is the minimum required by the ordinance, but the the property line goes to the center of the road, you know. So you have thirty three feet of right away, and then if you have and that your berm there, you know, so a hundred foot, and that is what's required by the ordinance right now. So. You just have Yeah. Well, if you just berm on the east property line. And I can add the ones in that that the town had mentioned, so. Turned on Vermont, it just says on the east property, there should at least be, I don't know how many feet, but there should be a little bit on the south because the whole city corner of Boston. Yeah, I mean, was that berm going to stay there though the whole time? If you're reclaiming, if you open up five acres, you claim that black dirt's going to go back over the top of that. So then does your berm move back? Are you going to leave the berm? By the road. I think what I'll have to do is put, I'll put uh, something under the topsoil on the berm and cover it with topsoil. Then it can just stay there until it gets nice to. You can probably use the next five acres black dirt, you know, to cover the existing, yeah, to reclaim. So I'm not trying to make it confusing, but no, no, I mean, normally it. that's what you yeah. use that berm for. Is your usually you, right? you use black dirt, but it's not a big deal to put. Something else there, and then just put six inches of black over it. So it can... okay. So we got that. Yeah, east and south lines. Number five. Well, I just got to be clear I'm back to the buffer. But it says buffer on south and east property, but it doesn't explain how far. I can see on the east long road to be the full distance, but you wouldn't read it on the south. Just around that hole? Yeah, you know, just, you know, 100 feet or something. Just around the corner. So, 200 feet, 150 feet? There's only a house that that house is goes back into a, another hill of some lines of trees there for that other that south house. So it really wouldn't even be necessary to get around the corner 100 feet. So I think eight feet. It is. Mm -hmm. So probably only two of them. That's what it is. Bobby, yeah. can you put the map back up on the screen? Mm -hmm. So east corner just doesn't show us how far the property back. It's been across from the from the town yet for a long time. Yeah, it's been right across the town fence. So. Yeah. There is quite a bit of trees and woods for that right in here. For that so hundred feet back, that's gonna get you into the woods. I think we're ready for a motion and then if you have one.
votes or whatever in the neighbor say I opposed the same. Okay. All right, so we'll close this one at 42. Here. Really close it. Yep. Close that one at next. Close this one at the next. All right. And Dr. Ford. Sharon, Sharon chatted in. Super, uh, Chairman O'Connell, Supervisor Kelly is now joining us by phone. By phone. Okay. She uh, chatted that she's in favor of the motion. That's what she was saying. Yeah. So, Carol, get her in the room. I'd like to make one public comment about this. Isn't it something that a guy can make money selling dirt? Yeah. In two places, it's amazing. All right, are you going to the next one? Okay, so the next hearing uh, that we have advertised on the agenda is Nick Walton Properties LLC request a conditional use permit to operate a gravel pit under Article 8L3 of the Polk County Shoreland Protection Zoning Ordinance. Property affected is Lot 3, certified survey map number 4603, Located in part of the northeast quarter of the northeast quarter, section 5, town 35 north, 17 west, town of Milltown, parcel number is 040-00121-0300. Um, this one here, I got it up on the map. Uh, we do have some wetland areas, and uh, this area is pretty much designated as a map wetland. The property across the street is commercial. Um, this is JJ's here. Um, just to kind of put it into perspective for you. It's fronted on the side by Highway 35, and it's fronted on the north and by the town road of 240th. The property, as you can see, is 18.46 acres. Uh, most of it is farmed. This is pretty much nothing going along the road here. Oh, uh, there is a travel pit that the applicant also operates at 1619 140th Avenue, city corner there. Um, this is the site that the previous uh, public hearing referenced as far as doing a lot of the processing of materials. The town of Milltown. Uh, has not submitted any comments on that for the conditional use permit in writing, uh, but they did support the rezone to mining. So this was just rezone to mining in that way we had your last 24 meeting as well. So uh, with that, uh, the county sent out all the proper class two notices and we haven't received any other letters of objection or support either. Yep, we have no exhibits in the file. So, and, that, and again, there's no floodplains. There is some wetlands on it. Um, I believe that the applicant from his uh, zoning change hearing um, has a smaller area and that, that they want to take material out of on this site. So, yep. 
public comment. Anyone? Jim, before, isn't it just the northeast corner? The intent wasn't it? Northeast corner of the foot? Well, across from your other pit. I thought you said the intention was to clear kind of where I can see the woods there on the northeast corner. At the junction of 240 and 35, kind of that up in that corner is where you were going to take the material off. You weren't going to deal at the bottom. Yeah, I was virtually just going to take the hills down. Virtually flatten out the land. That's my plan. And again, with this one, the object there is no, I was not going to do any any uh, washing here. It's a, it's a, same as the Eureka site. I no intention of doing any washing. Go through the conditions again. Can you pull them back up? Okay, so our applicant said that he's not going to wash any material on site, no mining into the water table. Um, hours of operation could be the same. Crushing of materials could be the same. Um, we don't really have a buffer um, in that property line anymore. That would be needed. Needed access in that would be something that we would suggest. Uh, I think we can go to the, up to five acres open at any time in that for mass, max two, no blasting on site, no asphalt or concrete plants on the mine site. And for this one and that, if there's any mining in that that's not internally drained, that the wetlands have the proper erosion control measures in that to keep any sediment or washing and that from going into those wetlands. So, um, and then uh, we would also want to put the condition like we did with the town of Eureka on there for the driveway approval and that to be through the town and that so that we get the proper driveway put in. And that would be our staff recommendation to approve on those conditions. Watch your thoughts, please. There's 100 buffer on south. No, I would remove that whole provision, provision five. There's there's enough wetlands in that on the property to the south and that and along Highway 35 there that he's going to be limited to keep out of those areas anyway. So there's kind of some natural buffer there. Um, it is a commercial self storage business to the south, you know. So there's not any houses right there. Um, so I think it'll be covered with the natural vegetation. So. On the northeast corner, straight across, don't you have one house there? As a rental. I don't know. I, I can picture that. You're up on the hill, and I think the house is off. It's not across. The closest house is here. One in here. Close That might receive this. The, where the next pit is, there's one house. Yeah. Well, I don't know where it is. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This one right here. So I just was asking because I, if it is, it's not a problem. And they're right there. You're at the other pit, aren't they? Yeah. Just, yeah. Just yeah. There, there's no complaints from any of the neighbors there at all. That is something that needs to go in the file. And that's that we, we haven't received any. Well, you sent back off 35. Them from the mining, yeah. so well, kind of different because the state owns 85 feet of right away there, or has 85 feet of right away, and that and we're 100 feet from the top. <laughs> but he owns the center of the road, so and that, so in other words, in that it's 100 feet from the center of the road, and that, but 85 feet of that is right away.
these conditions. Second. Thank you. Comments are not all those in favor say aye. Opposed? Ms. Kelly, where did she go? Okay. Hello. Karen, you want to? Yep, I just said hi. Karen's a little bit. Yes, I, I just said I. Five minute break at ten. Mr. Nelson, did you get a summary of the change? Huh? Did you get the property? Right here. Oh, there's some other digital polls. So okay. I don't know. Yeah. Know Were you here for public comment? Mm -hmm. And that. So it's Brad's notes are into the they be into the Brad's notes are in the record if you're okay on them. Unless you guys don't care what Brad's yeah, they should be underneath uh go back to five five and ordinance amendments and then it should be Brad's comments, the second one there. It's all timing. Yeah, There's I'll just kind of start with it in that. Well, 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 let's do the proposed text first. Because Kim hasn't seen, well, I mean, he hasn't been involved in that. So, would it be that one or the top one? <laughs> um, yeah, let's do the word version in yeah. case they need to change anything. So, and then Brad's comments, you know. So, okay. Um, Speak during the public comment. At the beginning of the meeting, no, and so I don't know. And then if we can jump back to that after a public hearing, and that possibly. So, sorry. Right. Thank you. We didn't know. Otherwise, you could yeah. actually. Pause it up. You could actually <laughs> do that during this ordinance and then the public hearing. That that would be good. Sure. Let's do that. Instead of putting it up for public comment, as part of our next hearings. And that, and then you can speak well, on, that, on that. So, okay. but then we're good. That'll be the best way. Yeah, I think it's just it's confusing. So, there's so many hearings. So, now with this many, this should go to that. Like I said, and that you guys don't have to act on it today. You know, that we, we can just simply conduct the hearings. But we want it. Well, it's on the main board meeting notes. It has nice to be put. Well, that was that was the rush, and that 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 Brad yeah. wanted it done in May. Yeah, he wanted for the, the, the building season. You know, the end of building season, keep it open. Two. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
public hearing notice in that that was published said that the environmental services committee will hold consecutive public hearings on may 5th at 10 o'clock a.m the proposed amendments to the comprehensive and shoreland ordinances include clarifying tax for regulating fences by adding two definitions and four provisions regarding where fences can be constructed on a property the proposed comprehensive and shoreland ordinance amendments also include changing the maximum footprint of a bunkhouse and that to a thousand square feet increasing the max height to 35 feet and make it allowable for bunkhouses to have a separate sanitary system the full county shoreland protection zoning ordinance also regulates boat houses uh, which are not regulated in the comprehensive ordinance of course and the proposed amendment also changes the use definition of a boathouse to match the definition of a boathouse in NR 115 Wisconsin Administrative Code. Uh, so that was all published in that for the two weeks prior to the meeting and that before today. We um, received three public comments that I would like to go through before we jump into the proposed text in that. I do have a proposed text summary. The first one, uh, was dated March 9th and it's opposition to the Polk County bunkhouse ordinance and it was a letter addressed to our um, committee here as a property owner on Bowen Lake we are writing to voice our opposition to the Polk County bunkhouse ordinance as property owners on Bowen Lake we feel that the committee should take one of the following actions number one is eliminate the ordinance completely Number two is increase the allowable size to a thousand square feet. And number three is follow state guidelines. And that was uh, submitted sincerely by Matt and Alyssa O'Hara. And uh, their cabin address is 1027 East Bone Lake Court Luck. That's exhibit one in the record. Exhibit two in the record um, is the exact same text, um, but it was uh, submitted by Josh Gitran. And their cabin address is 1727 East Forest uh, Circle on Balsam Lake. Exhibit three, um, same exact uh, form letter, um, was submitted by Robert uh, Claussen, and his cabin address is 2285 Woodland Shores, and that which is on Bowen Lake. So two off from Bowen, one off from Balsam. With that, oh, Bob's already got the Pull text up. This um, definition of a board house, this new text that exactly matches in our 115 that definition for a board house. And we are required in our county shoreland zoning ordinance in that to uh, match in that uh, state's definition. So scrolling down a little bit. Um, and this is another provision of NR 115 regarding the use of the building being able to be used for the storage of watercraft and associated materials. Um, it includes all structures which are totally enclosed have gross walls. Now. I realize everything else is staying the same um, that in the board house provisions. And again, these, these provisions do not apply to. Bunk houses. Um, we currently have a 400 square foot size limitation on a bunk house. We've also got some unique provisions as far as uh, you know, not exceeding 50% of the square footage on the main floor, but yet you can do the whole part of the lot area. Um, kind of very confusing that way. Um, and there's a lot of different angles to it. So what is being told? The committee wanted to increase the size to a thousand square feet. That total 50% of any square uh, floor area, you know, on that is being removed just to make it you know, a thousand square feet across the board. I think that will be a lot easier to administer. Um, Supervisor Olson has submitted some comments in that that would do after this. Um, and that in regards to the causes and what is being classified into that thousand square footage do you include stairways um you know as is a, a utility room and then included 
this text here and that came directly from Burnett County. Uh, when I looked at their ordinance, and I'm like, well, it's really nice that they're trying to provide some clarity um, on it. So any of that can be changed. There's no state laws that regulate that um, directly, you know, on that. But you guys want us to include in what you don't want to include. So very common, especially with the 400 square feet. People are like, well, can I take and make the other half, you know, in cold storage? Well, okay, that's one question. And that, well, then can I have my cold storage area sheetrock? You know, and it just goes on and on, you know, and it basically comes down to conditioned and unconditioned space on the building code side that would really apply, you know, in my opinion. Provision five and six that we currently have, basically, if somebody comes in and wants to take and have a legal bunkhouse today, they would have to um, either have a sewer system that's sized large enough for all the bedrooms in the existing dwelling and the bunkhouse combined, or they would have to replace their sewer system so that they had a, a sewer system for both structures. What this is allowing um, them to do under provision six, and that is to install a separate sanitary system for that bunkhouse. Um, and that, and also allowing them just to install a holding tank. Um, currently in the county, we allow holding tanks to be installed on any lot. And that, if you want a holding tank, you can have a holding tank. And that's one of the things in that, that I think will make it easier for people to actually permit the structure as it's gonna be used. So that we actually issue permits for bunk houses and that rather than garages with plated rooms or game rooms above, um, the big thing with this too, holding tanks, you know, we have a lot of old lots that were developed in the 20s and 30s and that in Polk County. And a holding tank only has to be a 25 foot setback from a private well. Well, if you only have a hundred foot lot and that, and you have two wells and that that are very close to the property line, it can take out a big area and that of the lot in between and that for putting any drain field systems on. Um, so that's why we've always allowed holding tanks and we've got a lot of lakes that have very high groundwater tables in that. So it's basically the only way that they can go. Um, so whereas a drain field has a 50 foot setback from those wells. So to get a big drain field in on the lot is problematic in a lot of cases. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why we have minimal lot sizes up there at one acre is because, yeah, you might get that first system in there, but then, you know, what happens 20 years down the road when they have to do a replacement drain field you know, they're running out of room. So, and these places are getting bigger and bigger, you know, and that, so um, it gets to be very tight, so. Okay, and then uh, this is a provision that I never really understood. Um, that's something that, that I brought to the committee just as a suggestion because a lot of contractors are having a hard time keeping the bunk houses under 35 feet tall. Um, or sorry, under 25 feet tall. So our normal accessory buildings, we allow them to go to 35 feet. So I can have a garage with a playroom or a game room up on the bonus room, um, and that without and that going through and having a problem with the 25 foot height limitation. But as soon as I take and make that bunk house, then the 25 foot kicks in. So that's another provision that that's keeping a few people from permitting a legal bunk house. And that is because they're limited to 25 foot height. So that would be the same then. Basically, any dwelling, any accessory building, any bunk house, they would all be able to be 35 feet tall. So just for consistency. Um, provision eight, and that is really interesting because a lot that doesn't meet the minimum lot size when it's created. And that is an outlaw. And we've already got provision 13 there, and that just says that a bunk house cannot be built on an outlaw. So those two essentially mean the same thing. So that's just a clean up. Any questions on bunk houses? Yeah. I think number eight. Okay. Should add that the uh, it should also be the UDC also, because it'll be inside. We just do outside. Yeah, we kind of got that here in that provision seven. The bunk house shall be built to uniform dwelling code compliance. And that's so that would include all of our SDS 321, 23, all that. So it's controlled by all, all that other one. Do you 
like to add you these to you down here. We can do that later. That just take it off. You're saying just remove provision eight? Yeah, because that just hit number seven covers it. And we can't forget. Some of the provisions were, were created in that originally because we were just getting into bunk houses. Tony didn't know how much, you know, in the last five years that we've had provisions to permit legal bunk houses, that you have only permitted three or four in that. And those have been around Wabble Bear Trap where they have the public sewer and they don't have to replace the whole sewer system. Or, or they were coming in and they were like, yep, we're building a new house, we're building a bunk house, sewer, everything's new, you know, on site. So that's about the only time that we do it right now. Otherwise, they're all, you know, team owners. So we'll just remove the then. So yeah. Get so there's a few less. Of course, if they're putting in a new holding tank, they're gonna fall underneath our sanitary ordinance with that permit issuance anyway. So yep. It's so just kind of shorten it up so five, six, eight out. It's a huge thing. Okay. Then I'm going to jump to fences and then we'll jump into Supervisor Olson's comments. Cool. Fences are something in that that you kind of got to know a little bit about Chapter 90. You got to know that about uh, the ordinances and just kind of piecemeal everything together. You got to know a little bit about NR 115 because a privacy fence is a structure, you know, so you, you're trying to put all this together. And with the county adopting the new codification uh, ordinance and that or going through that process, um, so that's a searchable form. We do get a lot of questions on fences, like what can I do for a fence? Um, so I thought it'd be really beneficial to clarify it in the ordinance so that when people search for it, that it's gonna come up in that with our actual rules. Um, with that, we also clarified in that some of our ice and stuff because the way our ordinances are right now is they would be treated like an accessory structure that could be 35 feet tall for a fence. Um, so one of the committee's suggestions was to limit privacy fences to seven feet in height. I know that Supervisor Olson has a, a comment about um, how do you determine that height? And that would fall back into the general provisions of the ordinance. And it's from most exposed grade to the top of the fence. So of the highest part of the fence. That's how we would measure it. So that would be post, top of the pickets, you know, anything like that. So um, that's how it currently is in that area right now. Um, a privacy fence being four feet tall and greater than 50% of the tape um, is typically what makes it privacy. It's less than 50% opaque, it's less than four feet tall, and it's solid. Those are not privacy. We don't have a definition currently in that for an open fence. Um, that's basically exactly what I just said, and that it's got to be more than 50% open. Um, and for this, we also wanted to take a site, chapter 90, um, and that because we have a lot of legal boundary fences, we wanted to take and break them out and basically give them an exemption for that because they are a legal property line fence. Um, so just to clarify that for the statute. And then the committee came up with a maximum of eight foot height. Again, grade up to the top of the post or to the top of the wire, whatever it might be. Yeah. So with this and that, then we tried to clarify where the fences can be placed. So uh, right now we don't have any of these provisions, but this is how we administer it currently. An open fence, and that can go right down to the ordinary high water mark. But an open fence within that 75 foot setback requires a land use permit. One, so that we can get the construction plans on how it's going to be constructed to make sure it's not a privacy fence. And um, then also on that, we have record of that um, so that we know where that's going to start and that where the privacy fence. Most of them that we get, it's a combination and that where they're doing a fence along their whole boundary, they're doing an open fence, then by their house and that right this. the uh, 75 foot setback, they go to a privacy fence for a ways, and then they might do a split rail in the back or something back by the road. <coughs> the committee talked about having a side yard setback. Currently, right now, we tell them in that that 
an open fence can go right on the property line or actually straddle the line because that's going back to a lot of those legal property uh, boundary fences. Um, and then a privacy fence can go right up to the property line, but you have to be able to maintain it. The committee's opinion on that was to take in a well for a two foot setback um, from the fence unless and that you can obtain the neighbor's permission and to put it on the line for maintenance. So we have quite a bit of conversation about that. A lot of counties and municipalities that do have something for a setback. Then provision eight, privacy fences shall be the road setback. That's where um, they're considered a structure. So they're going to be set back off the lake, they're going to be set back off the road. And that less um, that road setback is granted. Similar to like any of our other structures. That open fence, that normal open fences are exempt from road setback. So this is like the um, cow fence, the cattle fence, uh, you know, that you see the barbed wire fence, most of those are built right at the right of way. Uh, so this is declared by that, that those are exempt. So, okay. So those are the proposed changes. Can we jump to Supervisor Olson's? Or one of the next ones. So we have a seven and an eight. Should we try to get them both the same? It easier because you have a fence privacy of seven foot, you got to open at eight. Should they both be eight or seven? I'll see this. So that's you guys think they should be the same. That's not a substantial change, so that you, we, we could make that change at the public hearing or at a subsequent meeting okay. and include it without doing another public hearing. So I would feel so we should just say. There's not two different rules on the same fence. Same fence almost, yeah. They don't have any eight because everything's on there. Okay, now let's get into Mr. Rolls. Chairman O'Connell, Supervisor Olson is now calling in. He can hear us and speak as well. Oh, really? <laughs> you want me to present in that, or should we try to let Brad run through it? <clears throat> can you hear me, Jason? Yeah, I can hear you, Brad. And that would you like to present your idea so I don't speak on your behalf? I tell you what, why don't you present them and I'll tell you if you're wrong because I got just about no voice. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the first one in that that Brad had, that was uh, error on my end. That was already adopted. Um, that was the last ordinance amendment, but it was in my proposed draft that I put out there as underlined. Um, so that, that will be removed and that as part of my report to the county board is just taken, remove that because it's already been adopted. So basically that was just in regards to doing retail sales out of the home business. Brad, Mentions in that defining enclosed porches counting towards the square foot definition. Uh, so I think he's talking about the bunkhouse and having that thousand square feet. If you got a covered porch, that that would count towards that. Has some uh, comments about human habitation. What does that mean? That's for that human habitable area, that thousand square feet, um, and the act of occupying a structure as a sleeping place. Um, and then he's got definitions here. It looks like you looked up the legal dictionary, the free dictionary, and uh, basically they came in habitable is closed in against the weather, uh, running water, toilets, bathing facilities, heating, and electricity. Both of the above, and that could be for any building. So I think he's got some concern in that about just because they have some of this, and that doesn't mean that they're bunk calls or that that should be habitable area, I mean, I guess is what he's trying to think um, there because of the plant fall shop. So currently you can have an accessory building and that's not a bunk calls and that even though it's got a bath or it might have laundry in it. Or I think that might be what he's going for there. 
phone calls in there. Uh, I include the last in matter that the SS would be for. Um, well, we'll look at that when we go over proposed text. The stairway, um, and that is why we include the thousand square feet. You can definitely remove that if you want. So, um, some of them could be really hard to measure too. You know, if we go up, we got a landing, and then they go up. You know, I mean, that could it's not hard, but it could be maybe odd to include all of that. Now, why are we not using the phone calls definition from our ordinance to define phone calls? It's all tied back to the terms in the ordinance, so I think that that would be interpreted in harmony. Um, is what I believe. Fences, um, and that here's where he was saying about how they're measured, you know, and that. And like I said, our general provisions tells us how we measure height on anything, and that's from lowest exposed grade to the top of the tallest point. So if the fence post is above the panel, and that we measure to the top of the post. If it's the biggest, <laughs> That's your measure to the figure. And uh, you send us an email to. And this is his comments and that about shortening the definition of a phone calls. Um, and he's got this different give time. So if we could replace that whole first provision um, and that that's in the proposed text with this. This here would be like another provision that we could take and include down below it, where we have all of our other stuff about the plumbing, then have a separate space in the structure or accessory plumbing. Those footprint, this would verify the bone calls. Um, separated by wall, maybe. I mean, if you had a wall to divide, that might be. I don't know how I did, Brad, but anyway, if you got anything to add, go for it. Yeah, no, I, I think you've done all right. Um, I was just looking at trying to make the definition of a bunkhouse, I'll say, simpler, uh, a little easier to understand. But may, maybe I didn't accomplish that. I'm not sure. Um, but but no, I, I think you've done you done you done all right. Um, I think I do think we need to get the, uh, the stairway if it's going to a second story. I'm not sure that should count towards the, the thousand square feet. And then on the on the porch side of things, is that a fully enclosed four season porch, or is it just a you know a deck with a screen on? I guess is you know is that deck with the screen on? Is that counting towards the thousand square feet? So. I think what Brad's looking at is we're really looking at this big text here and that, that we're looking for. Uh, the capital area and that was within the exterior walls of the habitable area. So he's like, well, what's that habitable area when we look at toilets and all that kind of stuff? Do we include all that? Uh, so he was looking at possibly changing this, inserting that definition and that that he had in his email there, um, and that, that he listed some of that stuff. Did you find the definition? Habitable area. Well, it's, it's it's defined in two different places, one in the code and one in the statute, and they, they vary slightly. Um, so I guess the question is, do you want to address it here almost so you're anticipating the question later on so that we make it clear somehow? Yeah. We do have human habitation. And that defined in the ordinance, and that means an act of occupying a structure as a sleeping place, whether intermittently or as a principal residence. But the habitable thing, you know, it's, it's, I think you can do whatever you want, really do. So, as far as defining those spaces, I think a lot of these out, I think the old code has it. Well, and when you're talking about the, the 
the use of the term bunkhouse, I mean, I think everybody has an idea. The question is how how detailed do you want to get here so that somebody could kind of make some convoluted argument later on. Um, I think it's different than when you're talking about like a like a boathouse and habitability. I think that's where you know the question might become a little bit more gray. This one, I mean, because we're talking about sleeping quarters, bunkhouse. Just seems kind of obvious. I don't anticipate there being the same kind of concerns going forward. Maybe just simpler in that, uh, you know, all your square footage and that, excluding any garage area or something like that, or, you know, go back to that conditioned versus unconditioned space. I don't know. Yeah, the kitchen, kitchen can be crossed off right away. <clears throat> I would say an entryway, interior stairway. Steps are open, you pass out, you can't pick it up. Those are things in that that you could have on an accessory building and not even have it as a bunk house. You know, you could have a stairway, you could have a porch for an entryway. You have a deck. So some of that come out. So, like you said, it'd be a little simpler instead of this is way too much. But to me, I think it's too much. What What is the state? They don't have anything on bunk houses and that yeah. they've got for so dwelling. They have habitable a definition. Should we find one of those? You know, it's 1973. Well, and again, the question is, is you can have something that appears habitable, but it's not a bunk house and it's totally legal. Here you're just specifically, I mean, I think you have to look at it from a logical, from a logical perspective as far as, is this, is this a bunk house? Do we have beds in here? Do we have places for people? To sleep. actively sleep, but then we're going to call it a bunkhouse. So if you've got like a garage, a finished garage that's super fancy, you've got a pool table in the back. I mean, that's not. Yeah. Bathroom. So are we looking like we can take the closed porches off the decks? Do we? Your own kitchen, entryway. The closet would kind of be an interior wall to your stairwell. We just want towards regulate the, the amount of area used for sleeping. And go completely different on it, and that and say bedrooms are X number of size, you know, or whatever. You can have you can have up to a thousand square feet of bedroom and area. That makes it really clear. Actually, yeah. so all this other explain that when you say bedroom area, the bedroom area could be a thousand square feet. I'm throwing it out there an option or an idea of just regulating. <laughs> because we're trying to not include the toilet because that could be in a garage anyway without being a bunk house. We're trying not to include the storage areas or the stairways or the entry and. I don't have a problem with including it in a thousand square feet. Give us a book yet, sir. One's asked me and said, I can't. Oh, 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 raise my hand when you're ready. <laughs> yeah. What's the difference between an accessory building and a yeah. bunk yeah. house? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Can you sleep in an accessory building? You cannot. So right now, that's that's the line, and that and what we're trying to do in that, or what I think we're the goal of regulating bunk houses is different as a county, and that is to make sure that they do that UDC inspections and make sure that they've got good sanitary. But people are building bunk houses because they have more people at their property than what they can sleep in the cab. So those are the main two things that, uh, in my opinion, so, you know, I mean, if I was to go out and do a really terrible job building my garage and that, and I do, you know, things not to the electrical code, and then somebody comes up there and stays and my garage catches on fire, you know, I mean, we're trying to do the, the public safety aspect. Yeah, well, let's take some public comments. I know Mr. Nelson has some. Yeah, so, you know, I uh, I agree with everything going doing. You know, I think this is a good thing what you guys are doing because it kind of pushes people back from the lake because they're going to add on to the house, right? So by you already got the impervious surface on a garage. Great idea to increase the footprint. It's usually farther back from the lake. It's a good thing. Um, you know, a bunkhouse to me, I, you know, if I just took the text up there, I could sit here and talk all day long about every all these different ideas. And I think you guys get it. You know, you've got buildings within buildings. 
you know, you've got a garage with a bathroom, you've got a mechanical room, you've got a stairway, you've got this upstairs loft area or two story, and there may be, you know, they're already using this garage or this accessory structure for a pool room or an office, or they've got a little deck outside, or they've got a porch on it, or they've got a lean to. And yeah, I don't think any of that stuff should be counted against your square footage. I think your bedroom idea is good, but I think you should include so they don't get too big because all these people are putting as bedrooms up there, one or two usually, a bathroom and a kitchen, and kind of an area where they all hang out. So I think that's is trying to say, okay, what is that size a good size for, right? And I think a thousand square feet, you can do a lot with that space too. So I would just as a recommendation, if you took on the first line, a bunkhouse should be a maximum of a thousand square feet of, instead of saying habitable floor, you'd say um, bunkhouse. So the bunkhouse, you know, for me designing a space, then I know the bunkhouse area with the bedrooms, all that. Is you got a thousand square feet? Don't use the word habitable because you got other habitable area in the structure. So I, you know, if we're just defining bunkhouse, call that the thousand square feet. Square footage is measured as all area within the exterior walls of the bunkhouse area, not of the habitable area. It's the bunkhouse area is where you're measuring your thousand square feet, uh, and that can include kitchens, closets, bathroom, and the living area. I mean. You should include all that in a thousand square feet, I think. Um, and then, uh, and then cross out some enclosed porches. Cross that all the way out till you get down to the last sentence. Storage area must be separated, and segregated from any. Now don't say habitable again. Just say bunkhouse area. So there again, you're kind of saying, you know, if your building's bigger. And you have a door between your bunkhouse and your office or your lower level garage shop, you know, or something else in the building. You know, you kind of said, hey, the bunkhouse is, you know, that's what you're trying to do. That would be the comment. Because I think a lot of the people are, a lot of the people that we work for. Um, you know, because the thing is, what we get asked is, well, for a little over a thousand square feet, then we have to attach it to the building. So if you get over a thousand square feet of a bunkhouse, well, now you can't have it a bunkhouse. So what we have to do is we have to attach it to the building somehow. A walkway is an attachment. We can build a two thousand square foot bunkhouse for me to dug away, as long as I build a little patio cover from here to you. It's not a bunkhouse, now it's part of the dwelling. So if people want to get bigger than a thousand square feet, you know, you can still find a way to do it. Now it's part of the dwelling. And I think these bunkhouses, with just everything that's going on in the economy, people are living, multiple families are coming up and staying together. We have a housing issue already. I just really encourage you guys to just make this as easy as possible. And uh, I think this bunkhouse thing is a trend. Jason said, we build a lot of accessory structures and, and our company's built them for many, many years. And when we leave the site, they're an accessory structure, but we all know what happens to them because the sewers are too hard to hook up and they don't want to go through this 400 square foot. So they finish them, you know, there's hundreds of them, I bet, in Polk County that are bunk houses. <laughs> Well, just to follow up on Supervisor Nelson's comments, and that from an administrative point of view, that first thing I'm thinking is bunkhouse area. Bunkhouse area. What is that? Okay, well, we do have it defined in the ordinance, and I think it kind of fits. Um, so we have it defined as bunkhouse means a residential accessory structure or part of a residential accessory structure with or without plumbing, which is used as temporary sleeping quarters only. No cooking or food preparation facilities and no greater than 400 square feet of dwelling space. Of course, that would be the change in that. So it's kind of kind of in there with the dwelling space too. That's, you know, so. Kind of defining, so your exterior wall is just of that dwelling space, yeah. even though the building could be bigger. 
kind of like the dwelling space yeah, part of it. So cleaner, people would understand it. Just have to take the kitchen out of this one because there's no. <laughs> Well, no, we put kitchens in them. You just can't put cooking. They still want a bar. They still want a sink. You know, they'll put a little fridge in there. They just can't have a cooking device. Almost all these bunkhouses put a kitchen in them. They just can't call it a kitchen. It was really a full kitchen. They put a microwave in there. I mean, I don't know if we're regulating microwaves or pizza ovens, but everyone seems to put a microwave in a pizza oven. Yeah, and all of us would. Well, yeah. Oh, we might have some other public comment too. This guy does. Yep, thanks. I got a fine for an unpermitted dwelling. Back in 2019, we built a shed and a house. And now in April, I get a fine because somehow the house didn't get a land use permit. And I don't know how that happened. All the other permits are signed off. Uh, ben Campbell put the shed permit number on the building permit, but I don't feel like I should be penalized for that. I mean, if I would have known, we would have done it. So I'm open to test it or whatever we can do. I've got the sewer permit. I got the house permit. Um, I worked with Logan across the hall to figure out why this wasn't you know, done because we came in here and got all our permits. And we're not sure. I know a lot of new people were working. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How does she have to have that? I mean, it should have been caught back then before the house was able to have been signed <laughs> off. Terminology. Um, so on any building build a new house, the building inspector has um, on their form and that for the sanitary permit number and for the land use permit. They pulled the permit for a garage and Ben Campbell and then seen that and that or had that number. So that's the number that he filled in. That's kind of our double check in that. Um, otherwise Ben is very good at referring them back to the county, you know, and that to get the permit. Um, so that was how it was. Um, went through and then had a complaint here lately um, and that on it. And so that's why Wogan and that followed up on it, found that no, the house never did have a permit. Um, underneath the Torland ordinance and that the penalty fee is twice the normal permit fee. So um, according to our fee schedule of that, a new house is $400. So the penalty fee is $800. And that in addition to the permit fee. So that, that $400 permit and that goes up to $1,200. Um, and that because of the penalty, yeah. The county, and then just to give you a little history, had uh, after the fact penalty fee of five hundred dollars across the board, um, and that and that was changed here a few years back because if somebody cut trees along the shoreline and that without a permit, that's only a fifty dollar permit, but they were getting charged a five hundred dollar after the fact fee in addition to that fifty dollars, so it went up to five fifty. Uh, and so the county at that time said, well, if we do it twice the normal permit fee, that'd be a hundred dollar penalty. So now instead of your fifty dollar permit, and that it's one fifty. So it's kind of a sliding scale then. And unfortunately, when you get into a bigger project that has a bigger permit fee originally, that penalty fee also went up. So that's the provision in that that you guys can determine whether or not you want to look at down the road. And I'm just saying, you know, I paid for all the other permits. I would have gladly done this. I didn't know. It got signed off. We just assumed this was a, we're done, you know. So. In the interruption, I, I don't know if it's appropriate appropriate for the um, public hearing because it really isn't applicable to the bunkhouse question that you're addressing now. But if you want to touch base with me after, I can I can provide you context on how, if, if it was just a letter that was sent saying, right, you, you could appeal made. that to the Board of Adjustment. We sent a letter out, yeah, and then he wanted to provide public comment at the beginning of the meeting, but he was confused on whether or not he sure. should do it, and that for the, the hearing now, and that, and so 
Mr. O'Connell and I said, well, because it's ordinance related and ordinance sure. amendment related, that we will allow it to go now instead of at the beginning of the year. Or I could just give you my phone number and you can give me a call. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She's the boss. She's the boss. All right. Any other comments and changes? The comments. Brad is still a shit in. Does Brad have any more comments? <clears throat> no, I'm I'm fine. Okay. You. What does he think of Mr. Nelson's to change some of that to make it simple? I, you know, I, will, I will say that's somewhat where I was headed. I think that becomes it becomes a much easier understanding to read the definition of a bunkhouse. Um, with that, so so yeah, I would I would I would be for Mr. Nelson's proposal there as I see it on the screen. Um, it looks good to me. I think it cleans it up and makes it much more understandable. All them in there for the size, so it doesn't get huge. I guess. But you kind of wanted to keep those in there. So if you try to define, you can keep defining what bunkhouse is and all the things that are not. Did you start calling a stairway? Well, someone has a ladder. That's not a stairway. It's a ladder. There's a lot. I just I can hear people just picking apart every little word. If we're trying to do to find what? Oh, well, that's not a porch. That's a cover. You know, I just I think if we just you guys just try to define what a bunkhouse, what you want in a bunkhouse, and that's all we're then whatever else is around it, it's not an issue because it already isn't an issue. Just so I, I think I'm agreeing with you because this was the you're just narrowing it down to say anything within that area. That's what we're doing the yeah. kitchen, the bathrooms, the closets, the bedrooms. You have for a feed of. Sleeping area, bedroom, that's big. That's big. And it's you're going to have another 500 square feet to get the rest of it. I agree. You want to keep, I think you want to define what's in the bunkhouses, your bedroom, your bathroom, your kitchen. Have this big, no. Tremendously large area. It was just yeah. increased from 450 feet. Is that the screen in porch versus a porcelain porch? Is that included in the bunkhouse? I'm saying no, don't get into those definitions. I was reading up there. I have one more question. That's why I wasn't paying. I was trying to read what was put on there. Like a like a screen porch. The way I, I guess somebody came in and applied for it, a screen porch, I wouldn't include in the bunkhouse area. But a four season porch is almost like a family room. There's really not much difference, and that I would probably include that because you know they could have a a whole couch there, for example. You know. So we would include that, but like a screened in porch, we probably wouldn't, or like a, a normal porch, you know, and have a lot of these pole sheds or, you know, fancier houses have the little overhang over the door. You know, I mean, we're not going to include that, not going to include their garage space, um, closet, you know, like you said, kitchen, you know, bedrooms, you know. The screen, if a four season porch, let's say there's a porch on an accessory structure now, just devil's advocate here. You got a, I got a four season porch on my accessory structure. And I want to put a bunkhouse up on top over here. I'm going to grab the screen porch now, the four season porch that's already in the accessory structure. That that counts against the square footage. Or are you saying it's when it's attached and I can walk through my patio door into it? So I mean that's. The I would say that it's yeah, attached and connected. It's you know? connected to the bunkhouse space. To the dwelling space, yeah. Or the what? What are we calling it? Bunkhouse area. Bunkhouse. That's where you get into those. Now that screen porch that's over there, and all of a sudden you got beds in there, then I'd say that that would get counted. See, at the time you could sleep on a screen porch. No. This is where it gets fun. So well, that's what I'm saying is if you guys, <laughs> that's what I think. To me, if you just keep it about the, you keep it about the what it's going on in the living space. 
I personally would leave out porches, screen porches, entryway, stairwells, leave that stuff out of it because they're going to put that on their house anyway somewhere. Yeah, but it's going to be so the question is it's sort of a question and a comment at the same time. The last sentence, which didn't get lined out, was storage area must be separate and segregated. Well, back to that, my mind thinking, what size building are you building? Because maybe you want a normal garage size storage area. Or on, on the bottom, as long as you have a door, I think the idea is if there's a door between the two areas and it's segregated. Right, I'm just, I got that. I'm just wondering, should that be in the, in the thousand square feet? No. Or just let them build as big a store and the thing was about 60 garages now Chance. you don't build it you, put, you don't build it no one builds a 24 by 24 garage anymore oh no i'm not saying that at all I'm saying we're building garages that are 30 by 40 30 by 50 and yeah, yeah. i guess if it fits on in well, the square footage of the lot yeah they got to do impervious yeah. surface there's all the runoff yeah. ratings you got to oh, mitigate it what's the difference you got a tiny light, you're not going to get a big building on it. Yeah. Yeah, most 24 by 24 are game rooms. Yeah. They're not, they're not gonna... There's no cabin anymore, is what you're saying. <laughs> the trend is changing. Supervisor Kelly, it's been a little while. She raised her hand. Okay. Hi. I like the changes that have been made on uh, what I'm seeing here on the screen now. I think it makes the it makes it much easier to understand. I don't know about having to ha have anything in there about storage area must be separate and segregated. Um, I, I don't even know if we need that in there. I mean, we're talking about the minimum a thousand square feet for a bunkhouse area. I don't know. Why we're getting into storage areas then, but I'm not sure about that. If you don't, if you don't segregate them, you're, someone's going to call a big room a storage area. I see what you mean. Okay. It's pretty tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be the building <laughs> anyway. There for a part of the room. So. <laughs> So that one would pretty much favor that everyone. So saying like storage area, like if you have a loft, like I'm sitting in my loft and I've got two little doors that go into finished storage area, but that storage area is segregated and separate, so it wouldn't be counted in the square footage. Okay. Okay, I get it. So that one. Uh, it's sort of an ordinance, then. You know, if you guys wanted to make a recommendation to the county board, you could in that at this time, or if you want to talk about it at another meeting, you, you can do that too. We so, should do it now. Anyway, amend it now and keep it moving. So, we, so does it keep coming up? Motion to keep it moving. Yes. And then on the fences, should we do the seven and eight? Which one should we do so they're both the same? Be the other one. Should we just make them both eight? How do we have to amend that at the county board? Yeah, so what I'll do in that, so we're required to provide the county board members with a report on that, basically of how the public hearing goes. Um, I'll take and I'll make a bulleted list and then I'll the amendments in that that you would make on the floor. Then. So that would be this one, so that we get this right definition. <laughs> Correct. We would do the bunk hall stuff, and then we change the height of a privacy fence up to eight. Yeah, so they're both Those the would be the, the two changes that I've got. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Is everybody good with that? Pat? Sharon, are they both good with that? Hopefully. Yes. Okay, sure. This is Brad. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay. Oh, I don't make him say it again. Right. So you'll have that in writing, so we can give each one that in writing. 
Right. <laughs> so that we're not, we don't want to be provided with the county board meeting. Yeah. Cool. All right, then so, I'll entertain the motion. All right, can we close it first? No, we close the public hearing first. Then we can make 10 53. <laughs> Okay. Is there a second? Okay. So all those say aye. 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 Okay. Okay, it goes. Yes. What else do we have? Now we can take it just open up the comprehensive ordinance. Yeah. Do that other one. So this will be shorter. Um, so call that public hearing at 10 50. We've been the full county comprehensive land use ordinance. Uh, public notice was provided uh, for that. The two provisions that we're looking at changing um, are the fence rules that we just talked about for the shoreland protection zoning ordinance and also the bunkhouse provisions. Um, and that staff would recommend that you carry over the two uh, proposed changes and that to the amended text and that from the shoreland ordinance into the comps. So privacy of heights being eight feet tall and rewording number one and that of the bunkhouse text um, and that to be that new definition and that. So um, with that, I think you've rehashed all the text and that. So we didn't receive any public comment on that ordinance amendment. So. Any public comment on this now? Anybody on the phone? Not here. Bob, was there anybody on the anybody on the phone for public comment on this one? So we don't miss something. Anyone on the phone um, willing to provide public testimony? Uh, uh, am I on the phone? Yes, sir. What's your name and address? <clears throat> My name is Ron Van Tyne, V as in Victor, A N T I N E. And my <clears throat> home is at 2198. West Pipe Lake Court. Um, are you ready for me to uh, proceed? Yes, go ahead. Um, I've been trying to understand this in the context of looking at it on my property and the home I have had here now for 40 years to give you that context. The footprint of the foundation is, I believe, 32 by 34. So that's 10, that's 1,088 square feet, pretty much the size of what you're talking about. We have a two story home um, with a, a basement uh, on the floors one and two, um, uh, three and a half bedrooms. We can sleep in bed, seven people. We don't have sleeping accommodations in the basement, although. With a, with a thousand square feet, we could easily uh, put comfortably rooms to sleep at least eight people and probably uh, uh, considerably more. Uh, the structure, based on my being up cleaning the eaves with an extension ladder, I know would be 35 feet or less. So what you're talking about being permitted on, as a, a bunkhouse is the same as my single family residence, essentially. Uh, and so I'm thinking, well, how does this fit? Does that mean that this residential lot, I can convert my residential lot into a multifamily lot? I can put two, a multi-housing lot. I can put two houses on there because if you put something at a thousand square feet where you don't <laughs> take into account <clears throat> uh, all the things you're talking about, and even if you did, um, you're essentially saying to a property owner, you can put 
two houses on your lot, uh, no problem. And uh, to me, that seems to be really, um, uh, uh, well, look at it, then I think, well, what happens if uh, my neighbor wants to do that on his property? I think we have to think not only about the individual property owner, but also the impact on the neighbors. Uh, I think if I were to do this, my neighbor's view would be Judas. Van Tine has created you know, a multi-housing unit over there, or a, essentially a campground where he can bring in, he can already hook, uh, sleep, uh, handle easily seven people in his house. He has another house, he can add another at eight or eight, 12 people, uh, uh, plus all of this area that isn't included. So like having living next to a campground. So suddenly my neighbor's ability to enjoy his property in the way he thought when he thought we were building, having lots of single family homes is dramatically changed for the negative. And I think it's a brief of, breach of faith really on the part <clears throat> of the county. When we, when we set up residential lots, we anticipate these are gonna be single family homes uh, and suddenly we're saying now, nah, it's like allowing somebody to put on a, uh, 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 just add a little apartment building. It's, it's really not going to, to matter. Um, uh, I think it has significant impact for the, for the neighborhood. That's not only the people who live on my right and on my left, but down the lake uh, in terms of their ability to enjoy their own property in the way that they had assumed would be the case when they bought a single family lot. Uh, it's probably, it's gonna have a, it may increase the value of the person who uh, puts the second house on his lot, but it's certainly not gonna increase the value of the other houses around it. Uh, I think it has great potential to be harmful to our lakes. Uh, we're adding a more impervious surface which means more phosphorus running into the lake and a greener lake. It, it means we're gonna significantly increase if we can put essentially two houses up, we're doubling the number of people on my lot, I am, who are using the lake, which, and we all know that that's the primary cause of how our the quality of our water in our lakes is decreasing. And the quality of the water of these lakes and the environment of these lakes, I think, is probably the primary, you guys may, and women may know this better than I, but primary economic asset of, of Polk County because we don't have that much, all that much yeah, industry here. Um, and then you might just, I think it's worthwhile the, the corny old statement of walk on the other person's moccasins. Um, would you, if, if you had, if you lived on a lake, uh, and bought a lot that you assumed was a single family uh, dwelling lot. And, and somebody started to build these kinds of quote bunk houses, which are really a second ho home uh, on your right and on your left and down a few lots. Uh, are you gonna find that that has really uh, changed the quality of your life on your property? I think you would. Uh, I think that what we're trying to do here is create a loophole in order to turn a single family lot into a two dwelling lot, uh, which renounced the, the benefit of the contractors and the builders. But I don't think that it, their interest is what should be primary in terms of the county's uh, commitment to all residents, not just builders who are in and out, uh, make the money they can and they move on to the next opportunity and of course, they want as few restrictions as possible and maximum flexibility because that's what contributes to their profitability. Yeah, uh, temporary. So, so um, and you know, whether or not these are quote temporary sleeping quarters, the way this conversation is going, there's nothing temporary about it. You're gonna, you're gonna have friends and relatives and others coming up every weekend, staying for weeks enjoying uh, the ability to have a second cabin on a lake. I just, I think that's inconsistent with the whole structure of the, the zoning code as it exists 
and more importantly, inconsistent with the, the, ob the objective and the spirit of it. And I, I would urge you to consider those factors. I would also like to state for the record, I'm not representing the, the views of just myself. We had a group of friends over last weekend uh, uh, the, for a long bike ride were a bunch of bikers uh, and uh, refreshments afterwards. And I, I told them about, I was concerned about what I was reading on this proposal, went through it as I understood it, which uh, I think my understanding was correct from uh, what I've heard here today. And they all authorized me to express the views that I've expressed today as I had discussed with them last uh, Saturday uh, um, and uh, as representing their views as well as mine. And I would like the record, and we are all uh, homeowners on Pipe Lake or North Pipe Lake and one couple on Bone Lake. And I'd like to give you their names because what I'm respecting or stating now and representing now are just not the views of Ron and Carol Van Tyne, but 14 of us who are in on that conversation and have authorized me to speak on their behalf as well. And I'll go slowly with the names so that you can uh, note them because these are the concerns of 14 people. Uh, you have Ron and Carol Van Tyne. Secondly, Jan and Ellen Breyer. Thirdly, Tom and Joan Mears, who've been, who, whose family has been on this lake for probably 85 years at this point between two generations. Uh, third, the next couple is Jim McCarthy and Gloria Peterson, Dr. Gloria Peterson. The next couple is Bob Whitlock and Peggy Weber, W-E-B-E-R. The next couple is Dan Penny, P-E-N-N-I-E, -E, and his wife, Ann, A-N-N-E, Karyon, C-A-R-A-Y-O-N. And lastly, Reed, R-E-I-D, and Joan Billig, B-I-L-L-I-G. So, those are the 14 of us who feel very strongly that this is going in entirely uh, uh, unwise policy direction. And we would urge you to take into account these thoughts um, and uh, dramatically change direction on where this is going. Thank you. Thank you. And do you have those names? Because I, I really think it's important that the record contain this information and the fact it's not just one couple speaking, but there are 14 of us here represented by these sentiments. I'm happy to re-spell any of those names. Yeah, it's on the record. record. Thank you, Ron. Okay, thank you. What else? It, I guess the last thing I would throw in, it really sounds like a very deceptive approach. It's like, like what we're really saying here is that's yeah, okay to go put up a second home on the lot, but we're gonna call it a bunkhouse so it doesn't really look or sound so extreme. Any other callers want to provide public testimony? They want to speak for businesses that but any other callers. <laughs> Public eleven seven. Oh, it's what we just heard. It's always been around that way, yeah. Eight 
it is, but yeah, they're going to do it anyway. So what do you do? Yeah, you can look at some. All right. Dean emotion. You know. We'll move this one on to motion. 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 Yeah, like motion. <clears throat> All right. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Yeah. Chair, just to clarify in that the uh, motion and that would include the amendments in that for the eight foot height on the privacy fence and bunkhouse definition are under provision one in that there, correct, and Doug? The same as the shoreline. Same eight as the shoreline, foot. so that we're consistent. Mm -hmm. Yep. I just want to make sure that that's clearly noted. So yep. Yep. all right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Both of those will be at the main collection board. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, I would like to introduce our new uh, zoning administrative assistant, Kara Cook. Uh, Kara started in that on Monday. Um, so she's gonna be working at the front desk in the zoning office. Uh, between her and Carol, um, they're filling in and that for a lot of Lori's administrative duties. Um, we're looking at Kara and that to be uh, very familiar with a lot of those ordinances. Um, she'll be able to answer a lot of the phone calls, um, answer emails, you know, be kind of that front face and that in our office. Um, so hopefully she can help people with a lot of permitting. Um, so we're really hoping in that with Carol taking over some of the general administrative duties and that that Lori's done in the past. And then with you guys supporting the ascent program where the pumpers are reporting and that a lot of their own or all their own maintenance stuff into the computer. Um, there's been a lot of time that's been lifted off from Lori's plate and that. And so we're hoping that that it's going to allow care to be, you know, a lot more proficient on those phone calls, getting back to people in a timely manner, emails and uh, having a lot of that general knowledge of the ordinances. So um, she won't be um, doing pellets inspections or going in the field much. Uh, she's going to be mainly in the office and that would help with the walk-ins so okay that's all i've got so thank you very much for all your time today were you able i sent via email you sent me a text. Where's the last right? Well, put it in there. Materials, please. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'm ready if you are. Ready. All right. Uh, first one on the list here, update on the comprehensive trail network plan. We are uh, going to reach out to the consultant and ask them to submit a, a contract. I believe that they were in negotiations with county administrator. And uh, we're hoping to get a contract inked in May, so work can start in June. That's all I have for the first one, unless there's any questions. B, uh, we have not received a response from the DNR on the Mackenzie Creek wildlife letter that was sent. Uh, the letter was sent on the 26th, so no response yet. Update on the Sterling Trail. Um, committee received maps last meeting. Um, we are gonna go ahead and start working on signing and designating the routes south of Evergreen Avenue uh, up in the Sterling County Forest area. And if anybody, I, I do have a couple copies of the maps if folks want them again.
opinion different. Mm -hmm. So you can see the east-west road about halfway up the map. That's Evergreen Avenue. Uh, the blue line there, the red line, and the two little orange orange lines there on the southeast corner of the map. That's going to be stage one of the Sterling Trail. So work will begin soon on that. No questions on that, I guess. We can move on. Consideration recommendation of Lorraine Trail project. I don't know if uh, Supervisor Olson has anything on that agenda item. No. Well, did our did our easements get signed? There, there has. Uh, no, nope. There was not an official easement or an agreed upon easement until until yesterday. So. We can we can certainly send those out to get signed, but okay, that's that's why it was there, just in case they were signed, so we could move it forward today. It'll come back to us for I guess for 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 staff. Um, what is the committee's approach on working on the Sterling Trail, or I'm sorry, the Lorraine Trail and the Sterling Trail? Uh, last time, last time we met, or maybe two meetings ago, um, this, both those projects were sent to the ATV UTV ad hoc committee, um, and I don't. Uh, if we're going to work on the Lorraine Trail and sign easements, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done ahead of time that's a that's quite a complicated process a lot more work on the front end than there was with the, the sterling project um, i talked to supervisor olson his intent was to get this process on the rain, rain trail going so we need to just progress we're working toward getting the signs up in Sterling so that'll move that along. But we need to get the Lorraine started because they have volunteers up there. I just I was told at this point. So if we could get the easement and get it through the council board and ready to go. So if there is all the things, all the steps that you're talking about, we should work in Great. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree with I agree with Doug. Um, I mean, I think we need to be moving forward as ASAP. You know, whatever it is we have to do, that's just what we do to keep moving forward to to get to the point where that trail can start to be, you know, worked on to be open. Very good. And is there any way to ask the question probably to Malia even the easements aren't signed? But can we make a motion with the intent that they're going to be signed to move this forward to get it to the county board or not? At this point? I don't know that the the easements are the main hurdle right now. Uh, e easements are a are an important piece, but that's that's not the uh, the biggest. It's just part of it right now. Yep, there, there's going to have to be an environmental. We're going to really have to dig deep into the wetland and environmental aspects in the little rain trail where Sterling, we didn't have to. So that's that's gonna be the first piece of that puzzle. And I guess what I would like to do is come back to committee and then uh, the ATV UTV committee with a plan for development of that Lorraine trail, kind of a step-by-step -step what we need to do to get it going. All I had for Bob is, is this proposal, but it's just in an area. That's just the corridor. Yeah, yeah. corridor. The, there you go. But, so, I mean, all that has to be worked out as far as the actual trail, too, right? All those steps. Correct. Yeah. Yep. 
So is where is this project landing? That's just to help us with workflow. Is it UTV ATV Council to tackle this, this project? The answer is at this point, I hadn't even gotten it off the ground, so I didn't know where it was going. What we have is the concept and then the need to you know, secure those easements. Um, we just don't know where it goes. I think, I think two meetings ago, it was referred to the ATV, ATV Council. ATV, yep. So that's talk. something to add to your agenda. We want to keep it moving forward. So a recommendation would be to have the ATV UTV council put that put that as a priority or a I'll just kind of my own. Good with that one. Okay, the last one here is the ATV, UTV rules and regs on the county forest lands. This was something that was sent to PTAG and the ATV committee to both provide their feedback uh, and their recommendations. We combined their recommendations, uh, both committees, with, uh, with a list here. Most of this is pretty boilerplate stuff. Number one there, all ATVs and UTVs must, well, let, let me back up. Why we're talking about this, um, the county forest right now has a very vague rules and regulations in the ordinance for the county forest on ATVs. Uh, if we're gonna be expanding ATV use, it would be nice to have something a little more enforceable, and something that will help staff uh, make make clear decisions going forward with trails. So number one, ATVs and UTVs must be registered and licensed in order to ride in Polk County Forest lands. Number two, off-road motorcycles are not allowed on any Polk County Forest lands or County Forest trails at any time. Three, four, and five, and six are where we get into the seasonality. Um, Number three, from April 1st until the Friday before Memorial Day weekend, trails are closed to ATV, UTV use, including segments of any trails that may traverse town, state, or private lands. This is to protect those trails through the spring breakup. Number four, from the Friday of Memorial Day weekend through September 15th, you may operate your ATV, UTV only on designated county forest roads trails. Only machines meeting the state definition of an ATV UTV are allowed on the trails. All other trails and forest roads are closed to ATV UTVs. <clears throat> so what this, what this number four means, um, we have a lot of trails and this is, this is why I brought the, the map here. Um, all those little black dotted lines are temporary logging roads, little spur roads. All, all of those trails through Memorial Day through September, unless designated, are closed. Number five, number five is designed to provide access to a greater portion of the county forest during the hunting season. So from September 16th, through November 30th, you may operate your ATV UTV on existing ATV UTV trails and county forest roads that are at least eight feet wide and are not gated or burned. Now I'd like to add signed in there as well. What that does, that opens up all of the county forest roads through hunting season, all of the little spur roads unless they're gated, signed, or burned. Uh, there are going to be some roads that have to be gated and burned just because they're they right into a swamp or there's a river crossing, something of that nature. Um, but that will, that will really open up a lot of access in the county forests. 
Number six is the final seasonality one from December 1st through March 31st. You may ride your ATV UTV on designated winter use ATV UTV trails when there's four inches of groomed snow base. Pretty straightforward there. Number seven, county staff will manage, inspect, and monitor trails. Trails may be closed at any time for maintenance, logging activities, or to stop or prevent environmental or property damage. This is the one that gives staff the authority to go out, firm, gate, sign a trail if we see that there is damage happening. Speed limits. Uh, the speed limit on all designated county forest roads and trails, 25 miles an hour. Your ATV UTV must be equipped with a Forest Service tested and approved spark arrester that is in working order. Um, number 10, this is all kind of the, the boilerplate stuff. You may not operate your ATV UTV in a reckless manner without regard to other persons or the property, such that injury and property damage is likely to occur. You may not pursue any wild or domestic animal or livestock with the intent of harassing the animal. Number 11, you may not you may not operate your ATV UTV in any wetlands or within 50 feet of the ordinary high water mark of any surface water unless on a designated trail. Number 12, you may not operate your ATV UTV when county or state emergency fire regulations are in effect or when the DNR fire danger is posted at red flag alert. 13, you may not operate your ATV UTV on trails or roads that have been gated, signed, or burned, or closed to motorized vehicles. 14, no off-trail riding is allowed. So, um, as I mentioned before, the, the four or five items there that are the, are the, you know, have the most meat there to talk about is the seasonality and whether or not and this is this is a combined recommendation from the ATV UTV committee and PTAG. This is what we came up with. Um, but we've got a question uh, on this. We were talking that four inch uh, base. I think that should be changed to either four inches or twelve. Base. I've lived here all my life, and on any of our trails, we never even have four inches hard base. base you're supposed to say. Most of our trails on our snowmobile trails are four inches or more, just plain snow. Uh, a base. You're not going to get four inches of base on any of our winter use trails. So that wording I like to change four inches or six inches of snow, like the snowmobile part of it is. That's what it is in, in the This is just the start. This is just the start. Yep. It's an, it's an ordinance for it. Yep. So that is enforceable. We just want the sheriff to put two on. Yes. So we should get that too. Okay. So make a note of those two. Then it's got to be made so that it can be a citation. <laughs> so what did we have? He was he was not. Then Justin has a question. Who's going to groom it? The snowmobile ATV council. Because they want the trails. Not, they don't get it when they get done with the sun. It could take a year. But they can apply for because the first six miles are five feet. That's a state funded trail. And these will be continuums. They can explain it better if that didn't say that. Well, that. we would we would groom them even if it isn't funded. If we open them up, we have trails in this county that we groom all over long that are not funded. We'll groom them no matter what until we get them funded. So what is your to open up the trail for you guys, what is the, the snow snow that you need? Four to six inches of snow. Inches. Inches. Not big. Not big. It's just one of the changes they 
This will come back a few times. Well, and the only thing I can just say is as long as we're consistent with what they're doing for that, that winter as long as we're doing it, just make it slightly consistent. So yes. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. If you look on our easements for the call based on it's it's not a base, it's four inches. Hey, Ben. Yes. Is this coming back to us again, or is this like a final version today? This this will come back again. Uh, this will come back in. We're we're gonna have to either update or amend the parks and trails ordinance or the county forest ordinance um or maybe both so whatever whatever that recommendation is okay so <clears throat> i'll say I, I don't need to make the argument to change it today with no voice because i can do it at a later date i i think five needs to be changed some um, and maybe a couple others, but there will be time to discuss it at a later date again, right? There will be, correct. Okay, then I'll just let it be for today. Okay, so this is just the first weekend of this. Correct. Okay. Yep. You extend that chain to us, please. Either in our yeah, either in the mailbox or in the email. Certainly can. Are we pretty good then? That's all I needed. Oh, yes, yes. Here's my question. It's the cat tail master plan back with the DNR. It's been three years. No. No. Why? It's the DNR. Why did they hold that one up? Do we know why? I believe if I if my recollection is correct, they said we're gonna solidify the sour first and then we'll we'll talk about the, the cat tail. So I, that one. I don't think we've ever gone back and said can be so I I have no idea. That one. So we should get that so we have the sour master plans together and the solid. So we can get all these at one time. So we have to do these. We can do them all. That makes sense. But the cat tells the three. Oh. All right. Follow up with the DNR. On the next agenda. What again are, are you asking, Kim? You're just uh Response from the DNR. I want that on our agenda so we don't lose it for three more years. Specifically for the cat tail. In the sawmill. Mm -hmm. We want to go with those because that's what the beef takes for. And these all updated. The sawmill's a county trail, so there's no state required master plan. Master plan for it. Do we not need one for finance for to get it uh, state funded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but to get state funding, you got to have a master plan. Not, not, well, nece no, not necessarily. It's a county, county owned trail. Yep. Um, to get state funding, it's just uh, like for maintenance and grooming, that sort of funding. That's the same. You, you do not need a master plan. Yeah, okay. Andy, is that be included on the sawmill or not the sawmill? Yeah, the Dandy's got one. So I mean, but we got to get them all our master plans updated. All sitting around too much. So that we recommendation. What? Do you have a recommendation? What the heck? The damn DNR. Well, Bank of answers. So, uh, sawmill. No, the sawmill is ours. We don't. Right. That's what we got. But you're talking about gas. We, we should have something so it's in our rep plan or somewhere that we have a plan. Well, 
and just give it a different name instead of a master plan. It's a rec plan. So we know what we're going to do with it someday. That makes sense. We're putting it in a Right now, the sawmills mentioned in the outdoor rec plan, and then we, we have the comprehensive trail network plan coming from PTAG, and that, that will be incorporated into the comprehensive trail so network. Does it get missed? So that we have some of these, so we know it's, you know, that we like the sterling loops and these. So we know we're going to add to them. So we got some planning ahead of time. All right. Okay. Sounds good. That's all I got for trails. Anybody else? Thank you. Do that or she not? She's not here. No. Oh. Oh. No. Number 11. No, we've been requested by Sharon since she is proposing this resolution. Since she's not here, I wouldn't be able to do it over the computer. Oh, well, if she asked to just be moved back. I was thinking of the fee schedule 10. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I got a nervous there. Which one? I mean, you get that. No, we got to do that at all. We have to do up. We have to uh, make a motion. Yeah. That won't, yeah. Well, have an A, which is, is the next meeting. Yeah, okay. So it's, uh, the fee schedule with those three changes that you went through is what we're looking at. Yes, sir. Um, One, two, three, four. Excuse me. Right. The sanitary permits to be consistent with each other at 500. Um, again, comparing to our neighboring counties, we are we are actually under them. Under we're under St. Croix County, but less than for or more than Burnett and Barron. Hey, Bob. Yes, sir. How, how come the holding tank is not? Is more than the conventional that's in the mode. I think it takes a little bit more work. Uh, maybe you can answer that. More work. Yeah. So you have to have it. It's just more. It's more paperwork. It's I didn't more know more. if they should all three be the same. If you're applying for a that one gets Some registered, the, the register that it's on your deed and stuff. So the there's more thing. What's a Wisconsin fund application, Bob? Well, that's for the uh, subsidy. You have to meet a certain income guidelines. It's for medium or low income. You can get a uh, percent of your uh, septic system. That has sunset it though. It actually is sunset it this year. So that won't be around anymore. Mm -hmm. That condo review fee, again, we don't get a lot of those, but we are starting to see them, um, but they take a lot of time. And it's really equivalent, the work is equivalent to doing a major plat review. So that, that condo review fee is new and we're proposing at 600. And then again, I just wanna mention because Brad had questions about it, that compliance inspection is not related to um, our compliance officer. That is simply for real estate transactions, commercial real estate transactions. We actually are asked by the buyer, real estate agent, sometimes the lender to go out on site, ensure that septic's compliant, they pulled land use permits, and then we also have to write a letter confirming it is compliant for that transaction. So that is a new fee that takes a site visit, takes our time. Um, it takes a person to go out on site and uh, confirm those things. So that's another fee we're introducing. Do you need to add that if it's commercial? <coughs> Go ahead. That's a good suggestion. We could add that. Commercial only. And I just want to point out, we haven't raised fees in three years. 
are really just aligning those two sanitary permits to be consistent with a $50 increase. And then um, we're adding that new condo review fee as well as the compliance inspection. And then I'm missing, I guess, the land use permit for telecommunication towers. Normally, the contractor has no issue with that. We're just increasing it to what the state statute allows us to from 400 to 500. So, Bob. <clears throat> Bob. Sir. Um, the $500 that we want to go to for the sanitary permits, is that because of our cost has went up or we're just raising them because neighborhood neighboring counties have, and is, is the 450 still covering our cost? The 450 is not covering our cost. Um, we looked at it to justify based on our time. Um, and we also looked at the 2019 time study. One of the things that uh, that also includes that is not highlighted on the fee schedule, that includes the soil inspection. Normally we charge $30 for that. So that'll be within that $50 increase is that $30 soil inspection fee. And so if you look at our neighboring counties, they don't include that. It's an additional add-on. Want to put that in parentheses, Bob, behind each of those? Oh, yeah. Soil inspection. Includes soil. Yeah, I'll do that. That's a great suggestion. I could just put a parenthesis after that header under sanitary permits right. includes soil inspections. Okay. So then I got one more question for you, Bob. Are you ready? Yeah, I'll try. So the the signs mm -hmm. uh, for for profit organization and nonprofit organization. If we're doing this at cost, how can how can it be three hundred dollars for a profit corporate organization and only fifty for a nonprofit? Jason earlier in the meeting had answered that um, the reason why there is a fifty dollar cost was for some of our churches. And forgive me, I failed to. Churches. Yeah, smaller signs. Smaller signs. Less work than most of the for profit commercial types. The main thing. The signs are different for the nonprofits. They're smaller and there's less work, I recall. What's work? What if we're putting up the same sign size, same sized sign? We he just said in general, and but I, 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 I mean, a nonprofit could put up a huge, big billboard, billboard. just yeah. like a, a for profit. So I guess to Supervisor Olson's point is, since we're obligated under both statute and our current rules to look at cost, actual cost, and having a fee cover actual cost, should you look at taking away that distinction? Right, right, Supervisor Olson. Is that? <clears throat> yeah, I guess. I guess here's here's what I'm using for my for my idea at least is if if we're charging forty dollars an hour for staff time on a mm -hmm. sign, that means for a nonprofit it's only taking an hour and a quarter, but for a profit sign it's taking seven and a half hours of staff time. Um, and I somewhere I, I just. I just think that's wrong somewhere along the line that we need to get rid of one or even them out, make them the same, whatever they are. I, I just think we need to be come up with a more equitable number there um, as to what they are. Yeah, we're either undercharging for the nonprofit or overcharging for the for profit. Well, We struggle with that. I just can speak in terms of, you know, being responsible for the budget. That's a 
it's a whole shot in the dark there um, projecting that revenue um, we usually are under projections so yeah i'm not saying on the sign thing either number is wrong i guess mm -hmm. i just like to say as csb a little more i'll say in the middle yeah um, of of what that should be but um at any rate with that i have to sign off and go so thanks bob thank you yeah thanks you want to make those a little more consistent with the signage Well, and you'll actually adopt the fee when closer to budget time yeah. as a part of that. So I think this is just to get feedback, right? Yeah, it was just on our work plan uh, for this meeting. So that's why we're talking about it. Uh, we'll do that analysis and maybe we'll find something more equitable in the middle there make that um, and bring that to your attention for you to consider those, those sign fees are they a one-time fee or like if you have a sign up will you change your sign i believe so i believe so they go better somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that's coming back. So then we'll be at fall. Oh, that'll come back to our next meeting or whatever meeting. Or we could just yeah, we can bring it back to the next meeting or can approve these recommendations. And then when we when we, we tackle the budget through the budget process, I can bring back signed bonds. So what they add is what you're saying for your budget. That's what you're saying. You need something for the budget. I need to start thinking about that. Yeah. Motion to move that. When are these going to apply? 2022. So for the budget. Keep the Almost June. Now, June we start yeah. diving into the budget. So I'll entertain a motion. Say hi. Thank you. Yep. So, agenda item 11, since Sharon's not here, she's the sponsor of that resolution. Um, we'll bring to the uh, May 19th meeting. Other items, um, We'll see what Mo has for number seven, tax delinquent properties. Something might evolve there. I'll check with Jason. Um, I'm not anticipating any public hearings. I don't think there are any upcoming hearings. Let's see. The proposed amended um, shoreland protection zoning ordinance and comp land use ordinance from the Bunkhouse, Boathouse, and Fencing discussion. That'll be on your May County Board agenda. Uh, 9A, I can bring back to the May 19th meeting. We'll have an idea of our consultant and when they will be starting work with PTAG. Uh, 9B should probably be there as well. Perhaps by then we'll hear from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in response to the letter that this committee sent. I'm assuming it's in legal review. I don't know if we'll need to update as the Sterling Trail Stage One. What do you think, Doug? Should that? I was just going to say you could put two on there. Yep. Right now, Sterling, just we'll to give an update on how we're moving. Absolutely. Yep. And then. Um, well, 9E, we will share these new regs, rules and regulations for uh, county forest land trails with the rec officer and public protection. So we'll do that in the interim. Um, 
Is it too early to start drafting an ordinance? I like the idea of drafting something yeah. and having that. Well, that could be a goal for the next meeting. We could draft an ordinance. Do you mind if Ben and I take a stab at it first and then get it to you, Malia? Okay. Get it in the right form. Right. right. So, there's a lot of value for that, um, you know, not only for us as staff, but for our users to provide some assistance rules so they understand and get conditions and as we open up these county forest roads. So, Okay, I'll do that. I'll um, we'll run it by. In that well, so, yeah, it will be if it applies to his because I think that's important. We'll look at both the, the forest or forestry ordinance and the parks ordinance. It might apply to both, so we'll look at that. Thank you. Um, and we'll also run by the rec officer, and uh, yeah, we'll take a stab at drafting that ordinance for your consideration on May nineteenth. Yes, sir. Just additional on the Sterling. It wasn't brought up today because this brought up actually on page one. But yesterday's discussion was also that we're to increase the parking area and transfer four campground places. Okay. And involved, and Rick McWigan has been involved, and they're trying to get all this put together. But you can't technically start until July 1st. Has Mark been involved as well, Doug? I'm, I'm assuming, yeah. And that was in the CIP for this year. We had nominal amount, like, was it 3,500 for, for, for campground parking at Sterling? Is that so part of that project? Or? The reason we should get that all coordinated is because Bo only has, he said, I scheduling problems trying to get all this done. So if he had an opening before July 1st and had another funding, but you can't use the July 1st grant for that time. Because he would say something about we can always get the money that we can get the grant, but you can't extend it previously. You can get the reimbursement till next year. Ben, ben had all that. Okay. So there were so would you like to update a little update on that as well then? Well, that's what I mean, we could, yes, because then Paul said he could start. He didn't say he could start. He would do the platform. Is it the park? Is it all the parking lot and the campground? No, it's the parking lot at the ATVU team. The size needs to be changed. The loop. The loop. But yeah, where the uh, trailhead begins and ends. Yes. Sure. We'll update the committee on that. Thank you. Um, the schedule, yeah, I can bring um, the science piece by that. And then um, 11A, that's, um, that'll be a committee discussion. That'll be on there. Any other items? Any other items? Yes, any items you think? Oh, I see. Sir. So, so they would say hi. 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 Hi.